Okay, so this week we talk about function factories and um, this is chapter 10, a, a part of the uh, functionals, um, the, the function section. And uh, today we, we are going through the function factories uh, as the title said. So the learning objectives are understand what a function factory is, recognize how function factories work, learn about non-obvious combination of function features, and then finally generate a family of functions from data. Okay, so uh, as I said, um, a function factory, just to mention a bit, uh, it's a type of function that make other functions. Uh, so in this chapter, we'll talk about function factories and uh, we'll tackle some challenges in understanding how to make a workflow of functions. What is a function factory? So this is the first uh, <laughs> uh, question that uh, may arise you know we are talking about functions and that's fine but what is a function factory so a function factory is a function that makes functions so and factory made functions are man manufactured functions so we will see this in practice uh, um, with an example How does a function factory work? So as we already seen, if we take as an example, this, this function power, okay? This function power one. So this, um, let's say is the, uh, the factory, okay? So this, with this function, we will make a function. So starting from, from the, the factory, uh, in this case, we have uh, a function which does uh, accept some is exponential integers. And inside does an operation, which is in itself, again, another function and uses a variable x, which will be exponentiated, so powered of uh, the, the, the value that will be provided in, in the x uh, argument. Okay, so this is the factory. This way, once we've got the power one uh, factory, we can um, adding uh, the the elements uh, um, within the argument as required we create a function which in this case is square okay so the power is the factory and then the square is the manufactured function so the function that go uh, out from the factory. Okay, so basically, um, this appears ju uh, just as a, a name assigned to uh, something, as we normally know. We normally assign a name to, as well, a function or a data set or whatever uh, object is in uh, we are working on in r okay in this case this square this name here is not just a name assigned to uh, to an r object but it is a function in itself so it can be used as a function and that now we see how okay the um, uh, we have two examples one is square and one is cube, uh, and they are obtained changing the uh, exponentiation, so the power inside the power function. Okay, so what, let, let's, let's leave that uh, on a side for a minute. What we already know 
about function features in general. Okay, so the we know that uh, there's some first class functions, which they are usually made like function, a variable, and you can add something inside, uh, not with any other function, just first class functions. Okay. And this is the first thing that we, we already know. So we, we did the functions, we know what are they, we did the functionals, and we know how to map and do like combination of things inside and everything. Uh, what else do, do we know? We know about the environment in R. Okay, so we have uh, uh, this, um, we are provided with this function uh, environment, fn underscore env function, which allows us to see uh, in, in the environment of us, um, the environment of a um, particular function. So we can, this is another, in the environment, it's another important element in our factory of functions, okay? So we have first class functions, we have environment. Then the third very important element is, uh, it's a function, execution environment so now we have a um, first class function an environment and an, again a function execution inside the environment okay another environment which is the function execution so we can see that uh, um, i didn't uh, if you have any questions uh, uh please interrupt me jump in ask questions okay having said that the, the what we know about uh what are the function features and, and we already know how to use them uh we stop for a minute uh on this function execution environment so we we in this case the the we we can like use the example and say we make a function of x and we assign a value to a certain element of our interest a okay so we assign 2 to a and then we do an operation okay so our uh, x will be uh, increase it of this uh, amount uh, of this value so the result of this function uh, it's again a function so this is a function so h will be assigned with a certain value one and what this h1 does is summing up because this will be x summing up two to x so the result will be three so an uh, upper the, this is the very first step for function fa factories. Okay, it's a, like a function inside a function that releases an, um, an object which is in itself a function that can be used separately on its, on its own. Okay, so um, a function factory is defined as functional programming. Um, uh, as one of the functional programming tools and the other programming tools we have already seen it they are the functional and the function operators so this is a tool uh, that we can use but we, we it's very important to know how to use it can, because it can be tricky somehow um, and for example an application where this tools of function factory will be very useful in statistics, for example, it's uh, uh, within the box Cox transformation, for example. So then we, we, we speed up and we go to, to the statistics part to see these things and uh, to set the maximum likelihood problems and to do bootstrap examples, for example. Okay, so the fundamental elements for for this factory are uh, though the environments the force calculation the sub assignments and the cleaning up 
So if we follow this sort of uh, list of uh, to do things, uh, so check in the environment and see the fault calculation, do the sub, uh, server assignment and cleaning up, we uh, have a good chance to, to have built up a good function. So what are they? What are they? So we use the Rlang library uh, to uh, see inside the function. Uh, because this one is um, uh, an the, the objects uh, from Perl, and uh, so we can use uh, some uh, function which are um, then very useful. We use even scales in this uh, examples um, to format things using fac function factories. So what do we know? Um, when we look at this uh, at the function that uh, F, uh, are finally releases, so the manufactured functions, so those one that goes out from the factory. So in our example was the D square function, and we imagine to do not know anything about it. Okay, so we are presented with this function. Maybe we we are debugging the function. We don't know how to use it. So we start investigating about the function. What do we do? The first things is environment print function. So we do with Arlang environment print and square. So we see that in the environment, uh, uh, the square function, it's uh, allocated in uh, some position in memory. So this is the string that locates the function in memory. And then we see that the, there is a parent of this function, okay? And this parent is in the global environment. And then we see that uh, there are some bindings, uh, okay? There's bindings and unbindings, okay? So we see that there are some bindings in this function made with this, this X, um, element which is lazy okay so this is what we we see and we may say what is lazy mm, i don't i'm not sure about that so i'm not, i i know about lazy things in r and so you need to like give an input before they get the job done but what does it mean in this in this contest so let's see to know more about it the x uh, you know the power the number the integer that we should because we are still talking about the power function with the this this x that allows for integers okay inside the function so it's visible uh, and um, that's the engine of the function in some for, for understanding what's happening. And the computed value, which is uh, the square, it's a result of this operation. So power one with two inside. So I, I put two inside the power. Okay, this is what, our, what we know already, um, but you know, let's have a look a bit more about this X. Okay, so we do we can do function environment on square, so our manufactured function, and then select exp, which is the element that appear on the on the on the list. No? And we see that this is two. So exactly if I go back and see what was x. Um, actually, I, I have assigned two to obtain square. Okay, so this cannot vary because this square function is coming from power with two inside. So if I do power three, I don't have square, I have another function. So this way, what is it? this way with function environment i can get inside the lazy thing and see what it 
what is its value? The value assigned. Okay. So now mm, there, there is something nice to look at because something can happen in the within the environment. So basically, if I do compare the two functions when I assign two different values, x2 or x3, so the exponential 2 or the exponential 3, these are two different functions. Okay, one is named square and one is named cube. Okay, so uh, to make sure that every argument is evaluated, whenever it, x, whenever x is assigned to a different value. So basically, I want uh, uh, that this x will become just um, uh, like a variable well defined inside my function. But then when I do other coding, I allow for this x to assume other values without um, without affecting my functions, the, the, the manufactured function. So the function that goes outside the factory. So in the factory, I, I allowed myself to use X, but um, I don't want this X value to change if I again use it in the environment while coding, okay? To make sure that my function will uh, will be self self sufficient, okay, and will keep continue using that x without being affected to other code that I might do in the environment. I need to force something. I need to force the code. Okay. So what's happened here? Let's uh, um, let's see. So I have the function uh and th this is uh, all that we have already seen okay so this is my factory and this is my manufactured and now i have x inside so i'm i'm not specifying two i'm not specifying three i'm sp i'm just saying the value square my 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 new function will accept any value a value x okay then obviously I require to assign x to a value because otherwise my, my function doesn't work. Okay, so I assign the value. <clears throat> uh, if I do assign the value to two, I obtain the same result as before, just as the same as square was uh, defined um, at the beginning. So what's happened now if I continue coding and uh, assign x to three. If I run square two, this um, will be, so I, um, I want that this would be again four, but instead this will use three instead of four. So what I need to do is to, inside my function here so that now i change the name to power two to do not uh, like make confusion to the the point we uh, where we started um i add this uh, force function with uh, the exponent uh, um, exponentiator inside in a way that when i do uh Square two, I obtained four. So here, um, I think uh, um, uh, there's something wrong in the in the notes because that that should be another a different value of four. And so you need to do force to again when you do square uh, and assign x to a, another value which is not two. To obtain again four, okay. In fact, let's let's uh, uh, let's go back um, to uh, 
Let's go back to uh, uh, stop sharing for a second. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll share my uh, screen again because I, I, I like you to, to see something uh, just to um, uh, function factories. Okay. So as you can see, okay, when I assign three, okay, the result of my square two is eight not for as i wanted okay because i'm i'm i have my function i i assign to the function inside so this x the square function um uh, if if i do uh, square two at this point i could i i can obtain four so the correct answer but if then uh, assign x to another value a different value in my environment, when I run square two, this does the expo exponentiation three times. So this becomes the element inside our function. So, so to obtain our result, even if we assign a different value, we need to force the, uh, the argument inside the function. Let's go back where we were. Okay, so this I, I thought that this was a very important part, so that's why I uh, stopped a, a bit longer. Okay, so even if we assign a new value to x uh, and it's stored in the environment, our function doesn't take consideration of it and keep doing its calculation based on its first variable assignment. So another typical uh, thing that can happen is that you are um, building functions recursively. OK, so you do a function, a function and assign a value and then do another function which assign a value to the previous value. To the previous, see. Okay, so we could just use that. No, because if we do that, uh, that is not um, the right, uh, uh, you know, operator to use. So we need to use this uh, super assignment operator. This one here will force. Uh, the the factory to assign a function uh, which uh, will increase so does in, in in this case increase so that's the job that we want basically um so as soon as um uh, your function starts managing the state of multiple variable it it suggested to switch to R6. So if we do a lot, lots of this uh, uh, further assignments, so we are like uh, increasing the dimensions, it suggested to switch to R6. We are, R6 is just a, a con bigger container which saves space and allows for more dimensions. But, uh, you know, Okay, so one more tool to use when we build factories, it's the remove function. 
for example, we use a, um, an element to calculate another element. Okay, and this is what happened in our in our factory. So it, it would be very important to remove the first element that we use, like, like the, the row part that we use for calculating in this case the mean for saving space. And this is quite interesting because uh, this is your function. So you're replicating, uh, you do a random uniform and then a mean with the result of the uniform. So of the uniform. If you, if you use this uh, L object structure, so the length of the object structure package allows you to uh, see the object size. And you see that uh, the uh, different machines uh, allows for different, um, you know, this is what uh, the value from the book, and this is the value from my uh, computer. So uh, a little bit uh, lower. And so, but anyway, quite, quite big. If I remove my row, I can see that uh, the, the, the space uh, um, occupied, so the length, uh, it's, it's decreasing a lot. Okay, so the remove of the row part is very important. So these are, these are uh, I think, this, the, the, the foundation of building in functions. Uh, and um, um, so now we see some um, examples, some applications. So for example, uh, um, we have uh, like uh, this strange function here command format and then so you can use this function like this that's that's look strange a bit odd so but um as a the the way it may it, it is made it can be used inside a ggplot object this way so this is a more familiar uh way to see this function so this function functions here uh, so that you can use with the parentheses without uh, so inside the parentheses you can put or not put uh, or not uh, extra options are then can be used like that outside of uh, for example a grammar of graphic object this is uh, quite interesting and uh, if you have any questions, otherwise uh, go forward about this. Another option is, well, for example, to uh, as an example, uh, we, we can see it's with bin width when uh, in the book is nice because you, you can see that there are three, uh, so you can set up a bin width, which is that they are the numbers um uh, like you set for uh making um bar plot and you establish like the the number of bars uh within your data okay what happens if you make a facet so you have more than one uh, um than one than one histogram and you my um uh, do not obtain the wanted result if you assign just like if they are uh, different scales, for example, uh, assigning uh, the same bin width value for the the, the facet um, variable will result result in in a not a good. Uh, N not exactly what you want. Basically, you, you should assign a number of bins for each facet for, uh, for, for um, having a good result. So to do that, you can uh, build a function. Okay. 
and say this function uh, will go uh, will count the distance between the the, the minimum and the maximum and uh, it will be divided by the number of ob observations so this way you have a number which is a proportion and this will change within your facet um okay i'm i may be uh talking like <laughs> greek uh but um uh, in the book there's a nice nice example that will be clear then after so we can use uh, um other function which uh, we are provided with like n class stars and class cot and then class fd and this that they, they, they can uh, be used inside a switch uh, again for making facet of uh, bar plots to to obtain the correct number of beans for each facet okay um so uh, then the, the the last example it's about internals so we can uh, uh, like use this function to uh, to see um, what what happened in the development of the the plot okay now we go back there uh, and see i like to to um, go a bit forward we we got like 10 15 10, 10 minutes more uh, or something like that. So now there are some obvious, not non-obvious combinations. So the same things that we did it with the beans, the same things that we did it um, within the examples, we can do with statistics uh, uh, formulas like a box, box cox uh, or the bootstrap or the maximum likelihood. So basically, these are statistical factories that we can make. And um, here, uh, just to don't, don't, don't make it very complicated, uh, just go straight to the, the example, um, because otherwise, you know, you might get lost. So any, in any case, this is the box Cox function, okay? The original one. So this is um, how to make a, to make a box Cox. So what is a box box? Just to give a big introduction to do, avoid doing, saying things for granted, giving things for granted. So basically, it, you, you do a box box to, it's a transformation of variables to make your distribution uh, a bit more normal, uh, distributed. So you transform your data in a way that uh, with, the, with the transformation, um, you can obtain, it's like a sort of proportion, like uh, inversion of, of uh, your data. So, and here you can see that there is a log transformation for a certain level uh, that you find within your data. And then otherwise that would be powered uh, by the number that you find. And so you can uh, do a transformation with a proportion. Okay, so just to to give a uh, like an introduction, this box cox uh, can be modified. Okay, with a has to be like a factory. Okay, and we can use a stat function. I go directly here because this is what uh, um, the way should be done. Okay, so we can use a stat function here and uh, uh, inside uh, we use the function the stat function is one of the function we did the um, ggplot as well so this is to calculate uh, statistics uh, within your data with a, a specific function that you assign to it okay so in this case, you assign to box cox2, and the, the box cox2 is the function that uh, the, the the function factory that you made. So as you can see here, there is not another function. Instead, here there's a function. So let's leave that like that because we are now focusing on factories. So 
if lambda in this our case we do transformation okay so lambda is a certain value for uh, a distribution okay can be zero or greater than zero so if lambda is zero the the function will make transformation of uh, a logarithmic transformation otherwise that's a proportion oops Sorry about that okay so to make a stat plot uh, stat box cox function we use the stat function okay and it's a stat function that will be a function our our, our factory And this is our uh, manufactured function, the start box cox, that we then use it inside to make a, uh, a plot. And you can see this is done twice. You can see the difference within the two output. Uh, here is considered uh, a certain uh, interval and uh, while here is a, a logarithm scale so another interval you can see there's a some difference so a ni nice plot that can be made with this so this is the box box transformation that you can do to your data uh, and you can even as i said make a function that then you can use inside a ggplot uh, then there is the bootstrap. Uh, the bootstrap is a resampling method that we use to uh, like uh, argument our data. And um, so this is the, uh, the function. So we do force to avoid that uh, any uh, further assignments to our bar and uh, okay first we count the the number of observations then we assign force to var so we are uh, uh, bending it and then uh, um, the uh, again um, here we make a sample of our observation and allow for replacement so this is our uh, boot permute, and we use it uh, with empty cars, for example, and we see that we have a nice uh, bootstrap uh, example. Okay, so what else? Uh, uh, more things that can be done then, so we can add um a linear model assign fitted and recede then remove the raw uh, element so then then you can customize okay as long as you like uh, then we have the maximum likelihood estimation so this is like a probability so it's not so we use that to <laughs> calculate the maximum likelihood of something to happen so we use the poisson uh, this is the poisson distribution so in the, within the poisson distribution we have a lambda uh, parameter so basically the the maximum likelihood function is nice it's a nice function that we uh, build here this is the, the likelihood and um, this is a try to to see basically uh, again the number of observation and then you do the log of lambda because this is um, uh, to 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 find x and then, uh, so like a, a sort of proportion to this the distance from, from the other. Um, I don't know if you have uh, any, any questions, uh, but anyway, so this is the likelihood. Uh, so a function of a function. Okay, so once we have the count, 
we make a, fun, uh, a transformation. And then we use this to calculate the, the, the function likelihood on an assigned value. We can even use optimize with the, with the function a certain uh, range. Okay. Are there any questions? Maybe any personal experience, something to share, something to add, something like that. I don't know. Okay. So let's go uh, and finally see what are the, uh, the the applications that we are already seeing some applications. Okay, but so we now com combine functionals and function factoring to turn data into many functions. Okay, so we're now increasing uh, a bit difficulties. Okay, maybe uh, so we have uh, we can we we can do some some example like we have uh, a list of names uh, the square cube root cube uh, root and reciprocal with assigned some values and this is names and it is a list then uh, we make a function with the per map and we map the names with power one. So we exponentiate each uh, power of two, each one of these elements with the map function. Okay, so we, we see the fun, uh, fun root. We see what, what is the, the result of this uh, element if we use 64. So we go back to the root and see that 64, it's power two, it's eight power two. Yeah. Again, if we do just fun, uh, fun uh, root, we can see how is the function name. But this is not all the times. So there are some this because we made this function, and so we allowed to to see inside the function. But then there are uh, tricky things that you can add to your function to hide how the function is made. So this is, uh, you can see inside this function because you have made the function and the function is this, but exactly the function is map. Because, okay, so you, you are not seeing what map doing. Uh, okay. So we can use width uh, with, with a root of 100. Uh, to see what what is the the root, the starting point, we can attach fonts uh, fonts to to the environment. So this way, it's in within the environment, and then we can use the root hundred, and it will go and grab the function directly in the environment because we attach it. We can detach the function. And uh, we can use this Arlang uh, package, as I said, to see inside the environment bind, the binding things. So um, we have, uh, um, uh, again, some values. Um, I think I'm going to to see this and then uh, it, it's, um, it's done because I did another the conclusion, stop sharing and go to my R for a minute. So I like to see this uh, uh, final part. So I did another conclusion. 
Okay, so let's go here to the uh, to this part. So we, we have the names, which is a list, as I said. If we see what is this, this is a list of these elements. And then we do, uh, we map these elements to power one. Uh, now I don't have power one. Okay. But it should be uh, quite fast, yeah. Okay, so now we map the, this list with power. So, and then we have, uh, uh, if we do just fun, fun, because this is now a function. So we don't have any result of this map thing because this is now a function. Okay. Yeah, because map is a function of functions. So inside map, you allow for a function. This is a function. So the result will be a manufactured function. So then we can use this, if I do this uh, like, Okay, I have some some uh, list of things. I have a square, a cube, a root, a cube root, and a reciprocal of the elements. If I do the root uh, as done here without specifying, it do, it doesn't uh, allow. If I do four, it says two. So basically the engine of this function is powered to. So it says, what is the, it's saying, what is the root? Now, if I do like square and I do two, this four, okay. So this function is a fun, um, what is the definition? It's a function factory application. So combined functionals and function factories. So basically this is a function of functions, no, of, of many functions. Then what else? Uh, let's see. Okay, what I wanted to see is this, this element here. If I do that, I want to see what's inside here, the global environment. Um, uh, have you um, have something to add about that? Maybe. No, <laughs> maybe not. Okay, so I think it's um, it's all. I don't know if I covered uh, uh, all the things that we wanted to uh, to cover. We go the bottom of this these are the uh the facet of the histograms so i, I mentioned before and uh, if I go here to this uh environment thing and, and environment the, the binding because at the beginning we have seen like the lazy things the binding and the lazy things so this is the environment bind so we are binding the function in the global environment. If we have a look at this, um, this function. It's uh, bind symbols to object in an environment. So create bindings in an environment. So I'm binding my function. And uh, what are these uh, exclamation marks? 
Does anyone know? Maybe no. Okay, so uh, we we still the have split splicing operator. I think yes. we'll, we'll we'll see it later on in the book. It, yeah, in, in in the I think in the book. Yeah, it's going to come. I think in the meta programming part. Well, well, okay. Uh, sorry, not not in this chapter, but a, a later chapter. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Where is it? Um, because the, there is a solution of the uh, the exercises. What do you mean? I don't know. Um, okay. That's okay. So, so we we have some some other like extra uh, things to think about, like what are the difference between these two? Because um, so we know that attached does something and the the binding things as well. But um, so. Um, you learn about this in section 19, yeah, six. So we are like have an introduction of something that we'll see in the following chapters. There, there it is. Row bounding multiple data frame, uh, like unquote spacing. So the behavior of this uh, is known as a spatting. Uh, but I don't want to anticipate things uh, for the following chapters. So. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we, we did, I hope I covered <laughs> um, the few things that I understood, the way I understood them. And um, we see uh, each other next week for chapter 11. Yeah, who does chapter 11? Who is the... The next uh... I think it's Matt. Ah, okay, yes. All right. So I have a oh, good Federica yeah. for like yeah. house for housekeeping. Did we ever decide how we were going to handle chapter twelve? I remember John had uh, had mentioned yes. that one cohort had kind of gone deep uh, on on chapter twelve and just talked about object oriented programming in general. I, I think to set the stage for object orienting pro object oriented programming in R. Uh, but Trevin pointed out that it's a, at least in the, this book, it's a pretty short chapter. Did we want to combine or or uh, have it be a standalone presentation? Well, I agree to to combine if uh, if that's the case that uh, we can combine. I, I haven't I haven't had the, the time to to look at the chapter, and no one has replied in his luck but i agree in case if we want to who does the yeah combining that's okay for me I, I agree with that yeah what do you think what do you all think yeah let's combine the the, the chapter speed up a bit yeah so, so Tre trevin you've you've actually read the whole book i think right but before i think i've i've kind of looked before this book club i'd kind of looked through chapters and i have to say object orienting pro object oop for me is not the uh, is something relatively new unfortunately i i started the book previously but now i'm caught up to where i was well, don't 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 make but like uh, let let's say that um, if we need one more session, we add another session after that. That's I think we we can cool. try we can try uh, merging the the two chapters. If it doesn't work, we we have a, we can use an, another session. That's okay. Okay, so. Perfect. Thank you very much and see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next bye -bye. week. Thanks, everyone.